As you're finding your seat, let me invite you to turn to the sermon letter, which is called Hebrews in your Bible. This was a sermonic letter intended to be read or heard all in one sitting. The best bet for you to understand the book of Hebrews is to stand in your room by yourself and read the entire book front to back, out loud, dramatically. I won't do that for us this evening. I'm going to make an attempt at walking through this sermon. And because this is a sermon letter, it gets preachy sometimes. There will be an outline. But as you will see in this letter to the Hebrews, the author interjects warnings, admonishments, encouragements, therefores. And so my encouragement to us this evening is to listen in. Have you ever been nostalgic? Perhaps you think about the good old days when a McDonald's value meal was, well, not $15. If you're the kind that looks back on the olden days and thinks they were so much better back then, you recognize the phenomenon that we tend to look at the past through rose-colored glasses. We forget the difficulties, we magnify the good things. We forget the trials and the hardships and, and frankly, the mundane of walking through everyday life in the olden days, and we look back with wistfulness, wishing we could have them back. And I grant that there are some eras of history that are better than others, and maybe our best days are behind us, but there's a type of nostalgia that the book of Hebrews addresses that is very particular to the Christian life, and it is the nostalgia of your pre-Christian days. Do you ever look back at your old man life, your life outside of Christ, before you were a Christian, and, and maybe how comfortable it was, how easy it was, how fun it was? The friends that you had and the, the lack of burden with a battle with sin, or so it seemed. If you've ever been tempted by sin, if you've ever entertained doubts about Christ, they generate in a heart of wistfulness that forgets what the old life really was in darkness and slavery to sin, a burdened conscience and unforgiven. And worst of all, you didn't have the greatest thing ever, Jesus himself. The overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. You can sum up the entire letter, the entire sermon this way, Jesus is better and as you walk your way through this book, you will find out that Jesus is better than this and that and this and that. He's better than everything is the point. And if we add to that overarching theme, Jesus is better than everything, the sermonic point that the author has in mind, we might say it this way, Jesus is better than everything you're tempted to go back to. That's what the point of the sermon letter of Hebrews is. And while there is a very specific historical context that we need to understand, if we're going to understand the argument from which the author frames this main point, I think we discovered that the main point translates very easily into our own lives, even though we are far removed from a very narrow historical context. If you think about your own life, you think about temptations, you think about how hard it is sometimes to be a Christian in this world, maybe you've lost family, maybe you've lost friends, perhaps you've lost property or jobs or opportunities because of fidelity to Christ. It gets hard. And maybe you've been tempted to think, ooh, comfort, safety, camaraderie, fun, those were the good old days. Even though we might not find ourselves in the situation of the original readers, that theme comes through loud and clear in this sermon. So we're going to walk through this evening the theme of the superiority of Christ while pressing the point, Jesus is better than everything you're tempted to go back to. 
And in order to set that up, I want to set the stage historically for us just a little bit. We can set the parameters of when this book was written. It was written in the later apostolic period. How do we know that? Because in chapter 2, uh, the author looks back to a time his readers would have been contemporaneous with. They would have remembered this time, but it was a time of signs and wonders and miracles. That time has come to an end by the time this letter is written. He writes about it in the past tense in chapter 2. But we have another book end for this letter, and it is a date. The date is A.D. 70. In A.D. 70, the, the Romans came through Jerusalem and Judea and tried to stamp out Jewish rebellion. And the general, Titus Vespasian, rolled through the temple complex in Jerusalem and leveled the place. He threw every stone off of the foundation onto the ground far below. You can go to Israel today and still see those stones from the temple complex thrown off of that high wall, lying on the ground in a heap of rubble. A.D. 70 brought an end to the temple. The, the temple that Herod built, the temple that the Jews in Jesus' day worshipped in, the temple that filled Jerusalem and its surrounding areas with the sights and smells of animal sacrifice, with the highfalutin architecture and clothing and practices of the Levitical priesthood. You could taste it, you could touch it, you could smell it in town. It was very tangible. It's what you could see. That setting becomes very important for us because bracketed in between the period of Jesus' departure, his resurrection and ascension, and the waning off of the miraculous signs that pointed to his message, but before the temple was destroyed... You had a group of Christians in Jerusalem. They're called here the Hebrews. That is, they are Jewish Christians. They are familiar with the Old Testament. Hence, this sermonic letter is full of Old Testament references and images and quotations. They would have been familiar with all of the sacrifices, all of the procedures, all of the regulations that talked about how the temple was to operate. And yet, they had chosen to follow Jesus and in following Jesus, who was actually crucified by the operatives of that temple complex, Messiah was rejected by the shadows and signs that pointed to his reality. Now those shadows and signs are obsolete. You think about the veil in the Holy of Holies has been cut in two supernaturally by God when Jesus died on the cross. The way has been opened to the Holy of Holies. You no longer need the power brokers in their empty robes and their now defunct and obsolete ceremonies to get to God. You go through Jesus. But in following Jesus, these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem followed what was considered to be a scandal as a phony Messiah. They were ridiculed. They were desynagogued. They were often disowned by their family members. We read in the book of Hebrews that their property was plundered. It is likely that they lost their jobs. And Jewish Christians in the vicinity of the temple complex would not have been free to trade in the market. They would have been destitute. They had not yet shed blood as martyrs, but they had suffered. Oh, the comforts of the good old days for them. When my mom would talk to me, when I had all my friends in the marketplace, when I could socialize freely, now I'm a pariah following Jesus as a Jew in Jerusalem. And worse than all of that, following a Jesus I can't see in the shadow of a temple that I can see and smell and feel and the machinery of that temple is still working and the sacrifices are still going on and the priests do their thing and blood runs out the bottom of the temple and everybody eats the meat of the festivals. The, the very tangible religious order of things, which is obsolete, is still now working. It's like the company that's gone bankrupt and will never turn out a sellable product is still operating the machinery. It's only a matter of time, but these Christians don't know it. 
What would it be like to go against everything you can see and to go against everything your family and your friends are saying to lose all of the camaraderie, to lose all of the social standing, maybe to lose your stuff with the threat of potentially losing your life and still follow this Jesus who is a public scandal and cannot be seen. That's the situation of this letter. That is the situation this letter comes into. And that helps us understand a very serious implication for us, even though we're not Jews living in the vicinity of a still operating temple in Jerusalem in the mid-first century. You know something of the cost of following Christ. You know what it means to walk into the workplace and speak different live different, not laugh at those jokes, not do what they do. You're willing to be weird, to stand out. And maybe in 21st century America, the costs aren't quite as great as for these Hebrew Christians. And maybe we need to look to them for help as they're encouraged by an exalted Christology. That is a theology of Jesus that lifts him up as better than everything. Better than everything you're tempted to go back to. Family, friends, social status, religious structures, sin. He's better. The pastoral thrust in this letter is not just the information that Jesus is better, but the dire warning, don't fall away. Because since he is better, and frankly, since he is the only way to God, going back to the temple, going back to those old structures, those now obsolete and defunct operations, is actually to reject Christ by way of unbelief so as to be unrescuable. This is the doctrine of apostasy. And so the warnings throughout this letter are pointed. We'll have an outline on the screen and there will be interjections. And after I finished the outline and, and turned it in, it sort of looked like Christmas. There's green and red and white. That's not intended to be a Christmas theme or the Mexico flag or the Italian flag or anything else. It's just the way it happened. Warnings are in red. Outline points are in white. Encouragements and admonitions are in green. I don't know what I was thinking. That's just what you got stuck with. Okay. Let's read. Chapter 1, the introduction to this theme. And our first outline point, we'll word it this way. As the final climactic revelation of God, Jesus is better. We'll find out he's better than the fathers and the prophets. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. As the final climactic revelation of God, Jesus is better. Look down at your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days spoke to us in Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, who upholds all things by the word of his power, who, having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he, in, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. It's a mouthful and it continues. Tempted to just read the whole rest of the letter, say amen, and go home. Try to give you the outline here. Jesus is better than those who revealed God before him. And we're talking here about the Old Testament. What, What came from God through the fathers and the prophets? The inerrant, infallible word of God in the Old Testament. This is not a statement that the Old Testament was wrong or bad, or in error, or in any way, but Jesus is superior to all those forms of revelation in various times and in various ways. And we see that by contrast in the finality of, in these last days, God has spoken in Son. Our English texts add the word His, 
Just because it's kind of awkward to speak about speaking in sun, speaking in the, the language of sun, speaking in sunness, speaking in a, a sunly way. There's no good way in English to say this. But it is a manner of speaking whereby God is not giving indirect revelation through a prophet. But the word of God himself was on the earth and this is God speaking. Jesus is better. In fact, this is the testimony of the fathers and the prophets. Moses said, when that one comes, listen to him. He's superior. We find out as well that Jesus is better than the angels, verse 4. And you might think, well, that's no big deal. Of course he is. In various eras, people have entertained ideas about angels as these supernatural, fantastic beings, which they are, and elevated them to a rank to which they do not belong. In God's hierarchy, angels are lower than God's image bearers, humanity. And, and though for a while, man in his sinfulness, in his unglorified state, is a little lower than angels, they still rank higher ontologically, in other words, in their essence or their being. In God's economy of things, it is God, God's image bearers, man, and then angels, which are said to be ministering spirits to actually serve the elect who will inherit salvation. In the next age, we will administrate over angels. In this age, angels are servants, though we don't see them, we entertain them unawares. So very clearly, the argument that Jesus is better than angels has two grounding points. In chapter 1, Jesus is better than the angels because he's God. God actually commands the angels to worship Jesus. Nobody gets worshipped but God. And God tells the angels, worship the Son. That's chapter 1. In chapter 2, we discover that Jesus is better than the angels because Jesus is a man. Uh, this is fascinating. It's the, the indication that angels are higher or angels are lower than man in God's plan. We discover that the, the argument here, uh, verse 5, God did not subject to angels the world to come, but one has testified somewhere, what is man that you remember him for a little while lower than the angels, but you crown him with glory and honor. You put all things in subjection under his feet. In verse 8, now we do not yet see all things subjected to him, meaning humanity, glorified humanity. Verse 9, but we do see him who was made a little while lower than the angels, Jesus. We see him because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might test, taste death for everyone. What do we find out about Jesus? Why is he superior to angels? First of all, because he's God. Secondly, he's superior to angels because he's man. And notice his brotherhood with man. He came, called us his brothers, and laid down his life to make us his own. He associated with us. He affiliated with us. He, he came to bring many sons to glory, to bring them to glory above the angels. He being above the angels made himself lower to bring these many sons who are below the angels to be above the angels in glory with him. He freed the slaves, verse 15. He created a brotherhood. In chapter 3, we see that Jesus is not only better than the angels, better than the fathers and the prophets, but he's also specifically better than Moses. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. Here's this appeal to Jews who would have loved Moses. They would have looked to Moses. Uh, Moses as a name and as a man stands for all the regulations God gave through Moses to his people. He also stands as a model of faithfulness to God, a receiver of promises, and a prophet, a proclaimer of God's word. All those things wrapped up in this name. And Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, verse 3, in so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Do you understand the argument? Why is Jesus better than Moses? Because Jesus made Moses. <laughs> the way a builder makes a house, and so the builder's better than the house, Jesus is better than Moses because Jesus made Moses. This would be shocking 
if you were a Jew who had decided to follow Jesus in the shadow of the temple, having been disowned by your family, and you say, hey, mom, Jesus that I follow is better than Moses. Don't come home for dinner. That would have been shocking, threatening to the culture, threatening to the family identity, threatening to orthodoxy. This was heavy. And yet, this is the Christology in this book. By the way, it was Moses' Christology too. If you read Moses carefully, you would have been looking for this one. You would see no better candidate for Messiah than Jesus who came. Moses said, listen to him. So here at the end of this section that Jesus, as the final climactic revelation of God, is better than fathers and prophets, angels, and Moses, we get this warning. It begins in verse 6. It begins with the, ver- with the word if in the middle of verse 6. Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast. See, there's a possibility that we won't. And and I'm not dealing here with the doctrine of eternal security. I'm, I'm addressing what the author of Hebrews addresses and the doctrine of apostasy. That is, there are those who are attracted to Jesus, follow Jesus, profess some allegiance to Jesus, and then fall away. And then look at verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. As in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation, and I said, they always go astray in their heart. They did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Psalm 95, Leviticus 18. God is appealing here to their notion of history. They would have known the Jewish history. They would have known those dirty, rotten rebels who didn't believe God back in the day. Hard-heartedness. This is a warning against apostasy. Look, Look at verse 12. See to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. I don't know if you can see the red warning here. We've we've got the warning in chapter 2 that says, don't drift, and then this warning in chapter 3 that says, don't succumb to unbelief. And unbelief is a a seed that grows into apostasy. What is the remedy, verse 13? Encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today. Verse 15 brings up the warning Further, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Look down at verse 18. They were called disobedient. And then in verse 19, they were not allowed to enter the land of promise because of unbelief. All of these things are linked together. Hard-heartedness, disobedience, unbelief. And as contrasted with faith in verse 2, and then declared to be obedience again in verse 6 of chapter 4. This warning goes all the way down to verse 13 of chapter 4, and it includes this statement about the Word of God itself, the Word of God which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces down into the inner reaches of the human spirit. Verse 13 is the accountability of God's omniscience. There is no creature hidden from God's sight. All things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of of Him with whom we have to do. God sees the heart. He sees the seeds of doubt and unbelief that create a trajectory that leads to apostasy and disaster. And the warning here is check your heart for these seeds, seeds of unbelief sprouting in discontentment and disobedience, uh, a loosening our grip of holding fast on Christ. In chapter 4, we get a little bit, little bit of a transition in the argument. Here we see Jesus as the final climactic sacrifice for sins. And as the final climactic sacrifice for sins, he is better than, and then we go through a whole list of things that he's better than related to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He's better than the high priesthood of the Old Testament in chapter 4, verses 14, all the way down to chapter 
5, verse 10. And, and the comparison is made between Melchizedek, who is not of Israel, and nobody knew where he came from, and nobody knew what happened to him at the end. His life sort of has no bookends historically. And it's a picture of Jesus, Jesus who is eternal, and Jesus who does not come from the line of Aaron, does not come from the line of Aaron, does not come from the tribe of Levi, and would therefore be unqualified to be a priest under Mosaic law. This is one of the great arguments for the reason New Testament believers are not under the Old Covenant. We are not under Mosaic law. Mosaic law would not stand for a priest outside the tribe of Levi, outside the, the line of Aaron, and Jesus is in neither. Jesus is in the tribe of Judah, the king tribe. In fact, Mosaic law prohibits anyone from being a king and a priest, and we find out Jesus is both. What order of priesthood does Jesus belong to if not Levitical, if not Mosaic law, if not Aaron? And we discover this funny named guy named Melchizedek. And none of you have named your kids Melchizedek in this church, and for that, I'm a little bit disappointed. He is called the King of Peace. Uh, he is a, a remarkable figure in the Old Testament, and he is a picture of Jesus' priesthood that predates Mosaic law and postdates Mosaic law. We find out that the Levitical priesthood and all of its sacrifices and the Aaronic high priesthood would all point to the final consummative work of Jesus Christ on the cross, whereas he, he is our great high priest once and for all time. This would be a, a really important argument for those who lived and followed Jesus whom they couldn't see in the shadow of a temple that was still operating. Jesus is better than the high priesthood of the Old Testament. There's an admonishment in chapter 5, look down at verse 11, concerning him, concerning Melchizedek, we have much to say, it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. You're acting like babies. Why are you not mature? This is an admonishment. You should know better by now. You should be able to teach about Melchizedek. You should understand the relationship of Jesus' high priestly work over and against Mosaic Levitical priesthood. You should know these things and teach these things. Why don't you? Because you're, you're not prepared for solid food. Verse 14, solid food is for those who, because of practice, have trained their senses in the discernment of good and evil. You see, there's a flaw in the listeners of this sermon letter. There's a relationship between mature faith and mature faith practiced by obedience and discernment, discernment between what is right and wrong, discernment between what is in truth and in error. And this discernment comes not by information only, but by the practice of God's truth which is going to get us to the real definition of faith. Faith, not just a mental assent, yeah, I believe some things, I agree to some information, but something that involves all of life in a matter of soft-hearted obedience to the Lord. That admonishment is followed by a warning. This is a very serious and sobering warning, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 6. Listen to these words. In the case of those once having been enlightened and having tasted of the heavenly gift, having become partakers of the Holy Spirit, having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame." Why? For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is tilled, receives blessing. But if that land that gets the rain over and over and over again of the grace of God's revelation yields thorns and thistles, then it is unfit and close to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Now, if you've ever read this section of Hebrews 6 as a Christian with a tender conscience and been troubled and have said, have I committed the unpardonable sin? 
Has my sin moved me away from Christ? Is it possible that a regenerate person could lose his salvation? You need to understand some details about this section, and I would be remiss if we just skipped over this. Let me just point out a few things. Every phrase in this section is a phrase unique in the Bible to this section. In other words, none of these descriptors are used anywhere else in the New Testament to describe believers. And notice the the phrase, tasted, tasted of the heavenly gift, tasted of the things to come. That's probably an indication that we're just sort of taking things in. It's, It's like the fish that nibbles at the hook, but doesn't swallow it. It's not all the way in. Those who have been witnesses to the workings of the Holy Spirit and the powers of the age to come, they've been in and around the church, they've been around believers, they have had a front row seat to seeing God do undeniable and supernatural things. This is the condition of the churchgoer, the the one living on the edges and the periphery of a vibrant community of faith who maybe thinks for a time that he's in because he does the same stuff, agrees to the same information. But his falling away demonstrates that he never had true faith. And the tragedy of this kind of apostasy, the kind that says, been there, done that, I know it thoroughly, I've seen it all, and Jesus is nothing. A rejecter of Jesus with that much information is unrenewable. Now, that is a heavy statement. It is a description of real-life apostasy, and it is a real warning to the recipients of this letter. But I want you to notice something else about this section. The pronouns change on either side of it. Look back in chapter 6, verse 1. Let us press on to maturity. Verse 3, this we will do. Verse 4, for in the case of those... Did you see the change? Do you notice that? Verse 6, to renew them again is impossible. They crucify to themselves the Son of God. The ground that drinks the rain that falls on it, it yields thorns and thistles. It is unfit. Its end is burned. And then look at verse 9, the sandwich on either end of this warning passage, change of pronouns again. We are convinced about you, beloved, of better things. So if you're a Christian with a tender conscience and and you're battling sin in the heart and you're not letting go of Jesus and you're saying, Lord, help my unbelief. I I love you. I want to love you. I don't love you well. Help me. You're not in the category of apostasy. But friends, you need to hear the warning because any step towards sin is a step on the highway that runs down the path of apostasy. And unchecked sin leads there. Keep your tender conscience. Keep close to Christ. Hold fast and enduring faith. Whatever the temptations, whatever the old life pull, cling to Christ. He's better. He's better than everything you left behind. He's better than everything you're tempted to go back to. That's the purpose of that warning. Then that encouragement from verses 9 to 20 follows on. Um, We're convinced of better things of you, beloved. God is not unrighteous, verse 10, so as to forget your work and the love. He goes on to remind them of the fruits of repentance and enduring faith that have been in their lives. Verse 18, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of that hope set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed and one which enters within the veil. Again, a very pointed reference for Jews living in the shadow of the temple. They would have known about the veil. I have looked and looked and looked and tried to find out, did the Jews in Jesus' day try to sew that thing back together? 30 feet high, six inches thick. Did they repair it? Is there a a sewing machine that big? Did they make a new curtain? I've never found the answer to that. I would have to think that the, 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 the cost of putting that in would be prohibitive, and you just have to think, ooh, I don't know what we're gonna do about that. 
And then time ran out and the entire building came down stone for stone. I don't know if anybody uh, knows the answer or finds out the answer. Did they make a new curtain? I'm curious. But in Jesus, you enter in the veil. You're in. It's a remarkable encouragement, timely for us. Chapter 7 leads us to Mosaic Law, the Levitical priests, and the Old Covenant. Jesus is better. Chapter 8 leads us to the tabernacle, the sacrifices, and again, the old covenant, and Jesus is better. Chapter 9 leads us to the tabernacle, the veil, the holy of holies, the furniture, the memorials of God's grace and His provision, the the things that were in the the ark of the the testimony, and then all those reminders, the, the little bits of manna. And listen, Jesus is better than all of those things, and it doesn't make those things bad. They were really, really good. They were God-ordained. Every one of those sacrifices, if you didn't do them before Christ came, you actually were sinning. You weren't trusting in God's provision to take care of your sin. You weren't trusting in God's provision to restore relational uh, opportunities between man and God and man and one another. You weren't participating in the joys of God's gracious rescues of His people in all the feasts and festivals. These things were good and given by God. The word was good. The ceremonies were good. The laws were good. The prescriptions, the furniture in the temple, all of it was good. But they were shadows, forerunners. They were pointers. And when the one to whom they pointed came, they were unnecessary, obsolete. And worse than that, for the empty shell of religion that Judaism was when Messiah came, for empty religionists to still keep the machinery going and say, if you're following Jesus, you're a heretic, come to us, we've got the machinery. That is doubly damnable. That that is sort of the, the worst of human religion that rejects a relationship to God available by grace in Jesus and exchanges all of that for a righteousness of human making. It is empty. It was flamboyant. It was tangible. And it was out of date. Jesus was better than all of it. Chapter 9, verse 8 tells us that the way in was blocked until verse 11. Jesus made the way in for us. So he's better than bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, in verse 12 of chapter 9. And how is he better? He's better by contrast. He's he's better by the sufficiency of his sacrifice, the permanence of his sacrifice, the efficacy of his sacrifice. Listen, the, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And yet without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. And Jesus offered himself once and for all time, shedding his own blood and perfecting forever those who are being set apart to God in him. He finished it. He did the work that all those things pointed to. And so to reject Jesus and say, you know what, I'm going to go to the temple and sacrifice a heifer again. Well, there, There's no hope for you. If you go back to the high priest or the Levitical priesthood or or the temple complex or the sacrifices and the ceremonies, if, if you reject Jesus for the shadows and the pointers, you have no hope, no anchor, no advocate, no forgiveness, and you are lost in your sins. You must have Jesus. He's better than all of it, and you must hold on to him in enduring faith. There's an encouragement in chapter 10. Look down at verse 19. So draw near to Jesus. It's the common sense application of everything he's been saying so far. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, listen, these Christians who are following Jesus couldn't have walked into the temple and walked into the inner sanctum. But they have confidence to enter the real holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, his body crucified. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. 
sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Again, you can't see Him, but He promised, and His Word is better than what you can see. His promise is better than what you used to know. Jesus is better than all of it, so cling to Him, run to Him. It's followed by another warning in verse 26. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but the terrifying expectation of a judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. This follows right on the heels of the familiar verse in 1025, the you have to go to church verse. Don't neglect the assembling of the saints. Some are in the habit of doing, but go on encouraging as long as it is today. Are you your brother's keeper? Yes, indeed you are. Hold on to Christ and help your brother hold on to Christ. That's connected to verse 26. Forget the, the, the heading break in between them. There's a, coordinate or a subordinating conjunction that glues them together. Encourage your brother every day because apostasy. If your brother entertains the seeds of unbelief and doubt and the entertainment of old life sins and he walks away, there's, there's no other remedy for sin. You walk away from Christ, there's, there's no other substitute, there's no other atonement, there's no other sacrifice. Only the expectation of the wrath of God at the end of life. So hold on to your brother, hold on to your sister. The stakes are high. These warnings are real. Encouragement comes again in verse 32 all the way down to verse 39. Remember the former days. Remember how you embraced Christ. You even suffered the plundering of your property. You endured the cost. You joined Him in His shame and scorn and scandal. But you had everything because you had Him. Remember that? It's a timely encouragement. That brings us to chapter 11. It's been called the hall of faith. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Run your race. Uh, I think for most of my life, I, I thought the, the race was the show, my race. I'm doing laps around the track in the Colosseum, and I've got this great cloud of witnesses. Moses, Abraham going, come on, Smed. Run harder. And that's not what's going on here. They're, they're not witnesses to your race, Christian. They are witnesses to the faithfulness of Christ. They are witnesses to the value of Christ. They are witnesses by faith to the superiority of Christ. They all gave testimony to the fact that believing God at His word was better than what they could see and touch. Look back at chapter 10. Verse 36, you, Christian, have need of endurance. Well, let me give you some examples. Chapter 11. Here's what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Boy, did they need to hear that in the first century. Remember Thomas? He said, I won't believe unless you show me. Are you really risen from the dead? Where's the scars? Put your hands here, Thomas. You're blessed, but, but blessed are those who believe having never seen. And we who follow Jesus in the 21st century, we didn't see him. We're not eyewitnesses to his life, ministry, teaching. We're not eyewitnesses to the empty tomb and the resurrection. We testify of his reality. We believe him. We take God at his word. We've entrusted ourselves to Christ and and then there is supernatural stuff going on we couldn't explain in our own nature. We give testimony. We are witnesses. But we believe Him whom we have not seen. It's a great definition of faith. The assurance of the things that we have confidence in God's promise. That's the idea of New Testament biblical hope. God said things. It's true. We believe it. It's still future. Don't have it yet. But it's true. And we have the conviction of things we don't see. By it, by that kind of faith, the men of old gained approval. 
Now let's just summarize this list in the hall of faith for a moment. We'll summarize it this way. We'll keep with the theme that I've laid out. Jesus is better than, and we'll apply it to the situations that this chapter lays out. And there are some interjections. I'll highlight the interjections. But, but if you see in this chapter, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, and then in verse 6, you have and without faith. In verse 16, you have a therefore. In verse 26, you have a for. In verse 27, you have a for. And in verse 38, you have this little phrase, of whom the world was not worthy. These interjections are important, but the whole rhythm of the rest of the chapter is by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. So let's go through the list. Jesus is better than what you can see. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. In other words, we're so used to the visible, tangible creation. None of us were there when it was made. God was, we take him at his word. We believe what he says about it. And the visible, tangible, created world came from that which we cannot see. What's more real? What's more enduring? What you can see, which is temporal, or what you cannot see, which is eternal. Jesus is better than what you can see. We know that from creation. Jesus is better than religion. We know that from Cain. Whatever the difference is between Cain and Abel's sacrifice, one pleased the Lord and one didn't. One was uh, mechanical, procedural, not pleasing to the Lord. Jesus is better than religion. Jesus is better than staying here. We learned that from Enoch. He walked with God and then... That brings us to a principle in verse 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. Nothing's impossible with God. What is impossible is pleasing God if you don't believe Him. That is the foundation for everything. Verse 7, we learn that Jesus is better than friendship with the world. Um, Noah lived in the old world and the present one. He lived in that world before the flood. He believed God, built a box, got in it, and warned everybody about what was coming. Can you imagine how hard that would be? Stand in the middle of a dry plain, spend a hundred years building a box that's going to float on a worldwide flood. Who would believe that? And for a hundred years, he believed God and preached it and built it and trusted God and got in. We learn that Jesus is better than your birthplace, better than the certainty and anchorage of human plans and human comfort. Abraham left his homeland. We learn that Jesus is better than missing out on God's promises. We learn that from Sarah. Uh, she believed God trusted in God's promise. We believe that Jesus is better than life, better than belonging here, better than earthly comfort, better than friendship with the world. We learn that from all of the above, says verses 13 to 16. And in verse 16, we get this promise, God is glad to be associated with those who trust him. Verse 17 and 18, we learn that Jesus is better than children. Abraham learned that with Isaac. He trusted God when the keeping of God's promise about a descent seemed improbable, even impossible. Abraham believed. We learn that Jesus is better than your best life now. We learn that from Isaac, who ended his life with the blessings about the future. He's dying and he's trusting in God's promises that he doesn't get to realize in his own life. He's trusting in the next age. God will keep his promises even beyond this life. Jesus is better than seize the day. Get what you can now. He who dies with the most toys wins. We learn that from Jacob. Jacob's promises and trust in God was eschatology. It was all about promises of God for the future. In verse 22, we learn that Jesus is better than giving up when all seems lost. We learn that from Joseph. He said, bury my bones in the promised land. Look, I'm going to die, and I'm not there. But God said I would be there, so bury my bones there. It's faith. And he will be there. Jesus is better than government compliance when government compliance demands you dishonor God. We learn that from Moses' parents, verse 23. 
Jesus is better than celebrity, power, reputation, prestige, wealth, privilege, luxury, ease, comfort, good treatment, the pleasures of sin, and social affirmation. We learn that from Moses, who chose Jesus over the luxury lifestyle in the house of Pharaoh. There's a motivation in verse 26. The motivation is eschatology, confidence in God's promise of the future drives your present life ethic. Look down at verse 26. The riches of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. Why? For he was looking to the reward. Listen, end time stuff drives the way you live now. Moses knew that. Jesus is better than safety. Uh, Verse 27, we learn that from Moses as well. Verse 27 also gives us a fuel. Enduring faith is focused on the one who makes the promises. Look at verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the rage of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Listen, if you have a hard time following Jesus when you can't see him, when the temple and all the religious pressure is very visible, you're in good company. Moses believed the one whom he couldn't see. Verse 28, we learn that Jesus is better than being killed by the judgment of God. We learn that from the Israelites who escaped Egyptian slavery by believing in God. Following Jesus or believing Jesus is better than being killed by the Egyptians. Um, they, they trusted God so that they could escape slavery. I, I misspoke in the previous one. Uh, they escaped the judgment of God by uh, believing God for the Passover. They slaughtered lambs and painted the blood on the doors. They trusted God's word. So, trusting Him, enduring in faith in what God says, is better than being destroyed by God or killed by the Egyptians. Verse 30 with Jericho, we understand that faith, or as we're saying here, following Jesus, is better than leaving Jericho standing. They believed God, the walls of Jericho fell, and the obstacles to their blessing were brought down by God. We learn from Rahab that Jesus is better than perishing in judgment. Trust Him, find Him. Whatever your background, you can't sin too much to to miss out on Jesus if you will only turn to Him. We find out that missing out on God's plans, His miracles, His resurrections, His improbable military victories, we learn that from the judges, the kings, and the prophets. All of those are a benefit if you will only trust God. We learn that Jesus is better than missing out on God's appointed hardships. The hall of faith ends with those who were tortured, sawn in two, killed. Listen, Jesus is better than missing out on those kinds of trials. We find out at the end of the chapter they were approved by God. And they were waiting on us, Gentiles, to get on with the program. And they will receive all those promises. God will not short them. He said they would live in the land of promise and they will in the resurrection. And God's fulfilling a redemptive plan that includes us to participate with them. So you're in good company by looking at these. Chapter 12 is the turn in the book. We find out here that enduring faith must do some things. There are commands at the beginning of of chapter 12, shed the weight of sin, detangle your feet, run endurance your own race. Your race is different than any other follower of Christ. Verses 2 and 3, with your eyes on Jesus. And verse 4, resist. You haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding blood yet. Resist. The other encouragements there are to embrace fatherly discipline. If you are disciplined by the Lord, to loosen your grip on things that will lead you to apostasy. If God's getting your attention, embrace that. He does that with his own children. It's one of the ways you know you belong to him. And then verses 12 to 14 finish out with a a plea to gear up for sanctification. Strengthen what's weak, batten down the hatches, pursue holiness, it's worth it. 
There's another warning in verses 15 to 17 about falling away, followed by an encouragement from Christology. Jesus is better than all that stuff you're tempted to go back to, followed by another warning at the end of the chapter. And then chapter 13 gives instructions for enduring faith. Enduring faith practices love. What does that look like? Hospitality, prison ministry, uh, sexual purity, contentment, submission to your leaders in the church. All of that is followed up by the encouragement in verse 8 of chapter 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's faithful. You can trust him. As a warning in verse 9, don't be duped by false teachers, probably the ones who would try to lead you back towards your old life and an encouragement to the end of the chapter. Jesus is better. Look at verse 14. Here we do not have a lasting city. We are seeking the one to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God with the fruit of our lips confessing his name. Don't neglect doing good. With these sacrifices, God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Pray for us. I like verse 22. Endure this sermon, the writer says. Bear with this word of exhortation. Where over time you have endured my sermon about this sermon, I hope that this whets your appetite to study this book for a lifetime. You'll need it. There will be old life temptations, community pulls away from Christ, and you need to remember that Jesus is better than everything you're tempted to go back to. If you leave him, you're exposed only to the coming judgment of God. I didn't tell you who wrote the book of Hebrews because the Holy Spirit didn't tell us in the text. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this sermon letter. We have as our desire to follow Jesus outside the camp, to take up our cross and follow. Lord Jesus, we confess with our lips, we acknowledge with our minds this evening, we agree with your word that you are better, you are superior. You are worth following. Though we cannot see you, we believe you. Though we have not seen you, we love you. And we would acknowledge the weakness of our love and the feebleness of our faith. And we would plead, increase our faith. Let us walk with you in and out of discipline. Let us walk with you in and out of trials. If you would keep us from enemies, so be it. If if you would have us surrender our bodies to our enemies, so be it. We will trust you. We pray for your help in all of this. In your name, our great high priest, our sacrifice for sin, the one who has made our way into the holy places for direct access to yourself in all of your holy beauty. We praise you. Amen.